Today on Vegan Freak Radio, we talk about vegan verbal jujitsu, hunting and penis size, is there a link, gestation crates, and more on Vegan Freak Radio number 63 for the 14th of March, 2007. Hey, freaks. How are you? This is Bob. And Jenna. And we're back again for another edition of Vegan Freak Radio. Beware the Ides of March. Yes. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'll beware them. Yeah. You got anything? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I just thought it, I just thought we should tell our, warn our listeners. I mean, of you know, if it were Shakespeare time, they would have appreciated that. Indeed, they would have. They would have really appreciated it. Jeez. <laughs> Look at me like I'm on crack. No. Telling people to avoid the Ides or... Beware the Ides of March. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have a lot, of, a couple funny things we want to do in the show. <laughs> Interesting and funny things we're going to do in the show today. But before we get into that, um, we have a couple things I want to talk about very quickly here. Um, first, I want to say thanks to Vegan Cat and for the Cheesley. Yay. We got sent some Cheesley. <laughs> and we love that. Very cool. Uh, but also, I want to talk about a couple things from last week. Um, I've gotten some feed. We've gotten some feedback about the Temple Grandin issue. Um, and for those of you that are subscribers, you have already heard one piece of that feedback where someone said we shouldn't be picking on someone who's autistic. And I talked about why I thought that was wrong. Uh, her autism does not automatically mean she has no morality. Correct? Correct. So we already discussed that uh, on, on a subscriber show. But um, what I think also is, and, and this, this point has been raised repeatedly, the problem with Temple Grandin is that in the kind of agricultural system we have, uh, we're, we're, we're going to be very apt to see it to see someone like Temple Grandin. The problem, as several people have communicated on the forums and to me personally, I mean, there are posts in the forums and all this other stuff. Uh, the problem is, is that at the animal movement is backing her, right? And that, that shows how clearly flawed the animal movement is at, and really in every way. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, that came up in the show notes, I was apparently using the term masculinist last week, and that refers to a school philosophy that deals with a uh, huge emphasis on rationality and, you know, has bad things to say about femininity and things like that. I meant macho when I was saying masculinist. So there you go. Anyway, um, to get into more interesting things and move on to the content of the show today. What's wrong? Nothing. Okay. You were looking at the computer like it froze or something. No, okay. I thought I heard something. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we're trying a new setup today. Yes. We have a new soundboard, but the problem is it's running on <laughs> Windows. <laughs> 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 I, I told Jenna, I'm like, I'm going to have to put windows on your laptop. And she just looked at me like, eh. she had this look like, like, I, I, how like, dare you defile my laptop? <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was almost like I pointed to a toilet seat and said, there's chlamydia on that. You know, like, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so we're trying a new soundboard. Uh, sorry. I, so one of the things that um, I want to talk about here is, we want to talk about here is a little bit of vegan verbal jujitsu, how to argue with the, the kind of naysayer obstructionist prick in your life who wants to give you hell about being vegan or who just wants to kind of nudge at you. Yep. And we've all encountered these people who somehow it comes up. You probably you probably don't even bring it up that you're vegan. It probably just comes up, you know, just either you're eating with people or you somebody offers you something and you don't want it. And they ask yeah. you why or something completely innocuous. And Absolutely. Then, of course, the questions. The questions. Start. And I thought this was a good week to do this because we got a couple voicemails and a couple, I mean, a couple emails about this and a voicemail about this. So why don't we, what we're going to do is begin this segment with the emails and voicemails because they're interesting stories. Mm -hmm. And then we'll dig into some of the uh, yeah. ideas. The voicemail needs a little bit of introduction. Um, this comes from Mickey. And Mickey had sent us two voicemails previous, but I didn't want to play all three of them. Um, so uh, basically the setup is she used to work at a steakhouse. Um, and was really conflicted because she just became vegan and didn't want to work at the steakhouse, although, you know, you, you need a job. Not vegan. Exactly. And, you know, there they were really nice people that worked there, and she was friendly with all the people, and it was apparently a good job, and so she was really conflicted, but, you know, it was a steakhouse. Sure. So this is the, the, the follow-up voicemail we got. Hey, Bob and Jenna, it's Mickey from Texas again, and I just wanted to let you know, guys know about a couple of things that are going on with me. Um, first off, I finally made the decision to quit working at my, the local steakhouse, um, I think it's 
the problems with it finally mounted to the point where I just can't justify it anymore, and I've got my two weeks notice typed up, and I'll be delivering that to them tomorrow and hopefully be on my merry vegan way. And I'll probably end up working in Whole Foods, but I certainly hope not. Um, and I really wanted to thank you guys because after work today, I went out to eat with my good friend, and we got into a long discussion about my veganism. And um, I, thanks to you and your beautiful podcasts, I was able to counter every single one of his justifications for why he isn't a vegetarian or vegan. And he really brought up every single argument you have ever talked about. I mean, he brought up... He brought up uh, animals not being on the same level as humans. He brought up, oh, but I'm only one person. And he even brought up, um, oh, I worry about the animal problems when we've fixed all the human problems. And, of course, <laughs> I told him, well, what are you doing for the human problems? And, of course, he says, uh, nothing. <laughs> so thanks to you. But, but uh, I just want to pause that for a second because I, I hear this one a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, well, why should we solve problems of animals when we, we still have all these human problems out there? And I don't understand why we can't do both good question you can do both at the same time because the processes are all related they are all related so yeah and you know i was reading this this uh thing by michael albert who's like this famous lefty type many of you probably know about him and uh in, in the thing by michael albert he I mean he's talking about how he just can't be concerned about the problems of chickens when when you know he has to be concerned about the problems of sexism in his life and to me it's problematic because it's like you wouldn't begin a, a conversation with someone who was concerned about a social a social issue, a pressing social justice issue by saying, well, you know, I'll worry about your social justice once I've dealt with the social justice of the white men. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's just like that. It's it's They can't even see it. And that frustrates me a lot. And people on the left who are supposed to know better don't. And they are among the worst, actually. Yeah, because they should know better. They should know better because the left is about looking out for justice. The left is about protesting the dominance of the strong over the weak. And there is no other dominance of the strong over weak that, that's, that's as, as horrible as the dominance that we have as humans over animals. So I'm going to let this continue. Sorry. Okay. You guys, I was able to really drive home the important points for why he should go vegan. And he admitted it was a lot more convincing than he would like me to be. So um, I don't think he's quite ready to go vegan yet. But he is coming out to eat with me, him and his girlfriend, for my birthday at the local vegetarian restaurant. So hopefully that will help to convince them to make the jump. Um, thank you guys for putting out information and helping us convert new vegans. Um, oh, and thank you for doing a podcast on March 8th. That was my birthday, so that was a really nice treat. Oh my God. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy belated birthday. Absolutely. So, um, cool. I, I think this is a great voicemail because it shows that if you're at least marginally armed, Mm-hmm. You have a little bit of a little bit of uh, some of the ideas or the arguments behind veganism in your head. It's easier to to get out there and and have discussions with people. Exactly, and you don't get so flustered, and you know you don't know. Some people just don't know how to react to other people, and I'm I'm often one of them. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how to deal with that. Yeah, and I think you know some of you old school vegans. Um, maybe you're like, yeah, I know how to do this shit, and you probably do. But if you know how, you should be in touch with us about how to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think even people have been vegan a long time. Sometimes if you're like me, you get caught in this little vegan universe you live in and you forget, <laughs> okay, there are non-vegan people around. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, it's kind of weird. Um, I mean, I live with another vegan and I don't eat out much and my friends are vegetarians or vegans. So yeah. And I don't really friends have online friends online or vegans and <laughs> all my friends online or I, I mean, I'm or, kind of. Yeah, I don't really have many you, friends in real life. You don't leave the house very often anymore. <laughs> I'm a shut-in. There, if we had a vegan Meals on Wheels service, I, I would. Uh, I'd be very happy. I, I, I feel like just a, a quick aside here. Um, I, I really feel like our, our house was built in 1850. I feel like one of the original hab- inhabitants of the house because I'll tell you, I so rarely leave town. You know, I, I leave the house, but I don't leave town. I don't leave. The town we live in, it's a very small town because I'm on sabbatical. So I'm here, I'm writing. I leave the house to go take the dogs out. And then I come back to the house and work on vegan freak stuff. And I eat here. I, I don't know. It's just, I don't, I feel like the. <laughs> I've been doing most of the shopping since I'm, yeah. I'm out anyway. You're already I out. have to go to work. So. And you're doing the trip combining stuff. Right. So I always feel like, uh, I feel like I'm one of the original inhabitants of the house back in 1850, <laughs> you know. It's At like, least you have indoor plumbing. This is true. This is true. <laughs> this is a good thing. And I've got the internet, so yeah, <laughs> it, there was no internet in 1850. 
Uh, anyway, so Anyways. let's move on. To, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, let's read some of the stories um, that we've gotten recently about dealing with other non-vegan people. Non-vegan? Can we do another not vegan? Not vegan. It actually it works. works. It's no more ot vegan, we hope. If this USB drive gets disconnected again, though, we will be completely screwed. We have Windows on a USB drive right now. <laughs> Don't tell Microsoft. I think that's illegal. Uh-oh. Uh and the the little plug is very loose because it's like this cheap ass enclosure I bought. At, anyway, we're gonna okay. Yeah. Now let's rejoin our regularly scheduled podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. You read one. All right. So we we got this story from Herney, um, and Herney says here that uh, okay. He says he wants to thank us for the work we put into the show. And um, let's see, he says he really appreciates it. And he says he he was listening to the podcast, uh, driving from his parents' house in upstate New York to Pittsburgh. And if it wasn't for the show, he might have been, he might have exploded out of despair. And he goes on, he says, let me explain. I stopped in this little hick town in the middle of Pennsylvania. The area between Philly and Pitt is sometimes referred to as Pennsylvania. Tell me about it. We yes, used to we live in Pennsylvania. <laughs> to get a, ve- a veggie sandwich at Subway after about four hours of driving. I ordered my sub and was just standing in line when I noticed that this older dude was basically staring at me. Now, I don't know, maybe maybe he wanted some action or something. Anyway, I looked at him and said, how's it going or something like that? And, and he responded by telling me that it would, quote, kill him if he ate that, quote, unquote, rabbit food. I resisted the urge to uppercut him. Now, now, uppercutting would be not vegan. I resisted the urge to uppercut him, then said that it would probably then said that it would probably save his life. Then he told me that he was dying anyways because he had done two out two tours in Nam, and God knows what the government was spraying all over him. That's uh, probably true, but still. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, that's not a road you want to go down when you're just trying to get a fucking sandwich. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I just nodded and turned towards the counter. Another minute or so passed, and he decided to initiate conversation with me again, this time to tell me that he actually didn't eat beef. I said that was a good start and told him that since I have cut out all animal products, my physical condition has peaked, and I have had significant athletic success. He's a submi- Herney says here he's a submission wrestler. Wow. wow. <laughs> but then he told me he's been eating buffalo instead and that he orders them whole. Great. At that point I looked <laughs> I looked around at all the overweight rednecks and just felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. I paid for my sandwich and skulked off to my car feeling like the only vegan in a cruel ignorant world. The thing is once I was back on the road and listening to the podcast again I began to feel less like a lonely outcast and more like a member of a social community. I guess my point is that the podcast lets me exist Let's me exist as me as opposed to quote unquote the vegan. It provides an hour or so where it is assumed that I am vegan and that that can be unbelievably refreshing. So that was my official, uh, my official closest call for going postal in an entire village. <laughs> and also the moment when I appreciate having the podcast the most. Keep up the good work, guys. Believe me, you're saving lives. So thanks for That's that. Herman. Awesome. I apologize yes. for my inability to read. <laughs> no, but we know where you're at because I don't know. It's something about pencil talky that is scary. I agree. It's like we live in rural New York and it's nowhere near as scary. It's really not. And people here do not. They aren't really rude. I mean, we've got white supremacists nearby and they I see them every so often at the convenience store. <laughs> they have interesting tattoos uh-huh. <laughs> and they're a little scary. Well, yeah. But otherwise, most of the people here are not scary. No, they, they pretty much stick to themselves yeah yeah they leave you alone you leave them alone and there's sort of like this understanding right a very strong live and let live yeah i like that but in pennsylvania we got you get stairs and you get (laughs) people sitting on their porches with shotguns they're just more in your face and they're just much scarier (laughs) much scarier yeah so yeah so that part we we totally get (laughs) and it was wise of you just to sort of skulk on out of there and yeah yeah (laughs) because they may have been serving hernie on subway rolls after that you know it's like dude but um yeah i mean i think this gets at the heart of what we want to talk about though and that whole issue is like not (laughs) not vegan (laughs) not vegan um <laughs> it's feeling not vegan it's like feeling like an outsider in your own everyday life and it's unfortunate that happens but we want to talk to you about how to get around that yeah and um that's what we're here for i mean that's one of the reasons we wanted to do the podcast originally is to give you a you know to remind you all you're not alone you're definitely not uh, there are a lot more people out there that think like you who feel the same way you do about the world and we're out here we're just not unfortunately probably not in your community <laughs> your actual community we need to take over so, an island somewhere and make it a vegan yeah. you know well actually you know that would be not really the right thing to do because no. veganism is about trying to get people to think you know, it, it's like a like I, we always say it's a protest. That you're living in your mm-hmm. daily life. It wouldn't be any good if you were living on an island somewhere with other vegans. What good would that do? No, it wouldn't be wouldn't wouldn't do much good at all. Right. The idea of veganism is like moral protest right in your own life. Right. Do you want to read the next one? Okay, sure. 
This next one comes from Wendy. She says, please help. While on a two-hour flight on Continental, they serve me strict vegetarian on overseas flights, but not on domestic flights. The flight attendant passed out turkey sandwiches, to which I declined, and then pulled out my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Peanut butter and jelly. (laughs) The woman next to me asked me what I was eating and then told me how much she loved peanut butter and jelly and then asked me why I brought it on the plane. I explained to her that I don't eat meat, and then she spent the next hour pounding me with questions and explaining that she used to live next to a chicken farm and they all seem like happy chickens. And her son hunts wild boar, but only when he feels in danger, and that we have too many deer in Texas because of all the hunting laws have changed, and not because we are crowding them out for her studies. I told her a little bit about what I knew about chicken farms and chicken family life, and she said, but if they aren't, you know, if they aren't in the barn, they would be outside just laying their eggs anywhere they wanted, and that even, that even though the barn was cramped and filthy, the fault of the chickens, not the farmer, at least they weren't getting eaten by wild animals. Also, if there weren't domesticated chickens, there wouldn't be any chickens because they were incapable of living in the wild. I am fairly new at this, and I have listened to all your podcasts, and I did my best to discuss and not argue. I explained that my initial switch to veganism was for health reasons, but I quickly learned from listening to the two of you and reading everything that I could get my hands on has made me start to think of the ethical reasons for staying vegan. I had just downloaded the latest podcast with Temple Grandin, was trying to listen to it, but she kept talking to me. So I finally said to her, why don't you listen to this podcast while I read a bit? (laughs) It was pretty funny, actually, that she was willing to listen. After listening to the podcast and drinking her third airline bottle of wine, oh boy, she started talking again and explained to me. (laughs) She being a neurologist and understood the effects of a grand mal seizure and that cows are just stupid. They really have no fear of dying and that, of course, you chose the most radical person to talk about the slaughter process. She went on to say, what would these animals do here if we didn't eat them? Well, can, can we pause right there yeah, for a second? Sure. Temple Granite is not the most radical person. Uh, no. She's quote unquote humane slaughter. Yeah. You know? unless, she, unless she was talking about us. <laughs> well, I don't know. But, okay. but still, we're, I, yeah. Well, yeah, we are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, she went on to say, what would these animals do here if we didn't eat them in the rules of the food chain? Yada, yada, yada. And I replied, if we didn't breed them and factory farm them, then they wouldn't exist. And she said, so the breed would just die out? Guys, I feel like I failed. My boyfriend said I should have just told her to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I wasn't going to start a fight with her on the plane. What can I do next time until I become more proficient in my discussion techniques to deal with a person like this while I'm being held captive on an airplane? I guess I'm looking for just that one-liner that just makes someone stop to think what a moron they are and just shut up. That's from Wendy. All right. And we have this email. A uh, different situation, although it sounds like also being somewhat trapped. This is from Liz. She says, Liz, this is Liz in New York City, a totally committed listener, though rather shy correspondent. Well, you know, we're happy to have committed listeners. Mm-hmm. So. And we're happy to hear from them. Mm-hmm. Today will be the third anniversary of my vegan renaissance slash conversion, and I thought I would celebrate over a bowl of salmonella-free cookie dough and writing for the first time. I do have a debate point that I'm curious how you both feel about, as you've been so clear uh, how you feel about health food veganism. Admittedly, my choice to become vegan was based on a combination of your own ethical arguments from your book, John Robinson's health arguments, and a lot of the environmental arguments made in recent bestsellers like Omnivore's Dilemma, Fast Food Nation, and Jane Goodall's Harvest for Hope. I hope this makes me sound a bit like a triple agent as... I think this makes me sound like a, a bit like a triple agent, as all three of you come from completely different frames of reference. But anyway, my veganism remains firmly planted in all three arenas. What I'm doing for the animals, what I'm doing for my body, and what I'm doing for the earth. Over the holidays, I attended a family reunion with my brainy sibs and their brainy spouses. I am the disappointment of the family, only achieving a master's and then going on to be a musician. I had not seen many of them since I had become vegan, and was a constant source of think tank-like cross-analysis. Although most of my siblings are lacto-over vegetarians, as I had been for 20 years, they kept jumping on their laptops and trying to show me that you cannot obtain the correct omega-3s from flax seeds, and that I was seriously jeopardizing my health with this. Another tried to make me swear that I would stop being vegan if I ever became pregnant because of all the supposedly documented evidence that I would hurt the cranial development of the fetus. Another went, another went the whole B12 route, where I don't think I need to go here. This did not succeed in swaying me anyway especially since I have not been sick for a day in three years and feel fantastic, not to mention one of the reasons I became vegan in the first place was as an experiment to see if I might clear up a six-month streak of chronic bronchitis, which, ding, 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 it did. But I constantly found myself wondering what the two of you would argue, being as as these are a group of educated liberals who have no problem with the ethics of veganism, in fact, agree with them for the most part, but in my brother's words, quote, you shouldn't place your health in jeopardy over politics. Sorry for going on so long, but I'm curious what your comments are. Incidentally, I know the fact that they all have advanced science degrees doesn't really mean much in the scheme of things, but it gives you an idea of their resources. 
i.e. their peers instead of the Associated Press. So that is interesting for sure. Mm -hmm. And do we have any more? No. That's no, that's, that's all. Okay, well. Well, there's a lot here to go. There is a lot here. To respond to. There is indeed. First off, um, just to say that we are going to have a health show coming up. We in are. In the next week or two. We're not sure exactly when. Depends on when we got our interview scheduled. Um, and so we will respond to some of those specifically. But Yeah. And, um, you know, the omega-3 thing is ridiculous. It though, is ridiculous. Because where do fish get omega-3s from? Seaweed. Algae. Algae. Yeah. So why not eat the seaweed and algae rather than the fish? There you go. And um, flax seeds do have omega-3s. They do. And um, there's a really nice EPA DHA capsule called V-Pure. And I don't get any like sponsorship fees or anything. Mm -hmm. That's what I take. Mm -hmm. So I happen to think very highly of it. Mm -hmm. And where do animals get their B12? From the bacteria that lives in their <laughs> stomach. Yeah. And from microorganisms. They don't actually produce it. It's the microorganisms that produce it. So why not eat the but, stuff directly coming from the microorganisms? But the whole B12 thing annoys me because everybody who drinks milk drinks niacin and vitamin D as a supplement. Yeah. Why? Because... These are vitamins that, especially if you live where we live, you don't go outside much in the winter, you're probably vitamin D deficient, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they supplement the milk with these things, and no one thinks, oh yeah, you know, we shouldn't be supplementing the milk. Milk isn't the nature's perfect food or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. No one says that shit, but then suddenly it's veganism. We One B12 is, you know, I, I don't... I don't try yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but for your for your for your siblings to give them things that are documented scientific studies like the China study mm -hmm. and anything by Neil Barnard and the PCRM. Yeah, well the PCRM, you know, you might you might critique them yeah, for having for, for bias or for bi you know the the wrong kind of funding, but nevertheless they uh Barnard has published a, a series of peer-reviewed articles mm -hmm. in, in a couple journals, so I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Or even, like, I mean, Dean Ornish. Ornish, yeah. Except he, that, you know, Ornish always talks about fish and stuff, but... Yeah, but, I mean, I guess he's, like, kind of more mainstream, I guess, if you're looking for something more mainstream. But, uh, talking at least about how a vegan diet can get rid of heart disease. Uh -huh. so, I mean, there are lots of doctors out there who've shown with studies that a vegan diet is the most healthy thing you can do, a low-fat vegan diet. Absolutely. So. But let's talk about specific okay. tactics right. here, rather than okay, I'm sorry. specific gonna, answers. I just, just wanted to respond to that while I was on, my, on, my, on the tip of my brain. Okay, so I think one thing, I, I have a, a couple ideas about, about approaching non-vegans. Uh, I think if someone's arguing with you, um, I think it's important to remember that winning the argument isn't everything, right? I, I tend to be a very, the kind of guy who likes to win arguments. I guess prick is the right word. <laughs> I tend to be the kind of prick who likes to win arguments. Uh, if you've been on the forums with me, you know this to be true. I can get kind of mean. Um, and, I, you know, I tend to be that way sometimes. And it's not very useful. I, I know that. So I tend not to, I try not to do that with veganism very often. I think sometimes it's enough if you can just get someone to think about something, right? It isn't really about winning an argument, but it's about maybe getting that person, introducing to that person who's arguing with you just a moment of cognitive dissonance if the question is about, for example, animals and animal suffering, right? If it comes up that you're a vegan for ethical reasons, they're going to want to know. And I think it's important to put that little bit of cognitive dissonance into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, Wendy, you said in your email you feel like you failed, but you probably got this woman to think if she can remember everything after her three bottles of wine. Yep. <laughs> you gave her a moment of cognitive dissonance. She's like, but wait a minute, but what about this? And what about that? You got her to think about it. And she'll probably never go vegan, but... You showed her an intelligent vegan who was willing to talk to her, sort of. <laughs> I mean, sort of. I mean, you were you were a very intelligent vegan, but you know, she sort of talked to you. Is more of what I'm saying. She, would, <laughs> she sort for of as long as she it. wasn't blasted. Yeah, she was forced on you there. So yeah, is what I'm trying to say. Well, I, you know, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm up Gary Franzione's ass, all right? But we were talking about this, and I think he has a really, you know, in the book. The introduction to animal rights, he has this whole Simon the Sadist example. And he uses. He told me that when he's confronting somebody, he uses a similar thing where he said to them, you know, he asked them, did you ever have a dog? You know, okay, so let's say the person has a dog. Would you eat your dog? And of course, people say, no, I wouldn't eat my dog. And, okay, well, why wouldn't you eat your dog? Well, the dog is a member of my family. Uh, so, Francine, you know, is a stereo a member of your family? Well, No. Okay, so, you know, your dog is clearly different than another thing, right? Right. So, would you say that your dog has a mind? And most people out there would say, yes, of course my dog has a mind. You know, anyone who has a companion animal knows that they've got 
desires and fears and joys and everything, right? So they have affections, they have emotions. And then the question is, you know, if you can get the person to think about their dog and then get them to compare their dog to a cow, that's a great thing to do Mm -hmm. because it introduces that moment of cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I like that. I like that response. But I think um, I think it's important to kind of introduce some of that inconsistency and, you know, to get people to understand that inconsistency and get them to think about it. So I like that, you know, getting people, I think companion animals are a great way to get people to think about some of the ethics of, of veganism because that's how a lot of us come to it. Mm-hmm. Not, not all of us, but some of us. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, if, if you can get people to think about that, if you've had that discussion with them, you know, say, you know, there are a lot of web resources out there if you're ever interested someday. You know, go look at them. And I know some people carry around pamphlets with them, like, everywhere they go in case somebody's interested, you know? True. And so if you can find a good one. So, you know, these are kinds of things that you can do. Uh, But I think it's important that, um, I think people have this idea of vegans as completely joyless. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that you not be joyless when you're talking to a non-vegan about veganism. Yeah, even Even if, if, I was going to say, even if you've heard the same question a million times. That's right. I think you have to. I think you have to grin and bear it mm-hmm. because do you know how many times I've heard the plants have feelings line, you know, and I don't want to dismiss somebody. Be- it depends if they're being an idiot. Yes. But if they're, if they're being serious and some people are serious, they will try to make this argument. I like to have that discussion with them. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to do it. So I think the important thing to remember is, is that you really shouldn't concentrate on kind of quote unquote crushing, you know, the person that you're talking with. I think it's, is really tempting to kind of, to try to shut somebody down or to, or to get them to win or to, for you to be able to win personally. But I really think the goal is to get the person to reconsider what they're doing, mm-hmm. to reconsider their position on animals. And if they're asking you, usually they have some kind of interest. Yeah, a lot of times it's out of curiosity. And you can usually tell if it's curiosity or malice. Yeah, and if it's malice, you know, it's wor- I think it's, it's fine to say to the person, look, are you serious? Mm-hmm. And if you are, you know, if you're not serious about this, well, then there's no point. Mm-hmm. I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, and it's not worth your time. Um, and some people do have a genuine curiosity because they've never, ever thought about this before. That's right. And you just not doing what they're doing brings it up. Well, we've, the ideological machinery of our society is such that this stuff is always shut off. Mm-hmm. It is always closed down and foreclosed. We're not supposed to go there and think about it. Yep. And there's there's all this stuff in place so that we don't think about it. You know, you're, you're often teased. You're called sentimental. You're called milk toast. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're a male, people assume that you're your girlfriend's putting you up to it or your wife or that you're gay. I mean, what a ridiculous number of things mm-hmm. that go along with this, but they're all kind of tied into this. Mm-hmm. And so if you can get someone to think about it, I think that that is very compelling. So I think it's important or worthwhile or interesting to actually have some ideas in mind, a couple a couple ways you might structure an argument. If you frame that argument, you have the ability then to kind of get someone to think about something. Mm-hmm. So I think it's worth having I don't want to call them sound bites because that's not really what I'm after. Almost like stock responses or yeah, maybe. something you've thought about. Exactly. Like that you can present. And this is especially important for people like me because, you know, I think about these situations and, and I am extremely introverted. Extremely. Okay. <laughs> extremely. And um, actually, you know, introversion is an interesting thing. You were just listening to a podcast the other day about it. Satisfied, Satisfied the mind. mind. Yeah. Um, and I've read a book about it just because it's so interesting. And it's not just being shy. There's a whole lot of other things that go with it. And one of the things is often what you'll do is you'll have a conversation with someone and then two hours later you'll think, why didn't I say X, Y, and Z? And you'll replay that whole conversation over in your head and you'll sure. feel really bad about it and you'll be like, I'm such an idiot. Why didn't I say that? I should have spoken up. Don't put yourself through that. Have some responses ready in your head so that if the question does come up, it's more automatic mm-hmm. and you can respond to it. Um, because I know I'm I'm just not very good in situations like that. I'll do it. I'll be talking to someone and they'll come up with something and I'll be like, and I'll have no idea how to respond on my feet. But if I if then I think about it for a while, and this this happened to me actually this past semester. Someone said to me, you know. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. You're a vegan. And the first time that said to me, I got a little flustered and they didn't know what to say. I just sort of walked right. away. The second time they said, I'm like, you know what? I know exactly what I'm missing. And I knew how to respond because I had thought about it. And I sure. replayed it over in my head, you know, being the introvert that I am. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think this kind of thing, you know, can be important to do. Yeah. I mean, there was a line somebody on the forums gave me. Um, I get around my students sometimes. I'll go over to the student center and sit down. I'll see them eating 
you know, there's a little cafe there and I'll see them and they'll call me over or whatever. And I'll sit down and start talking to them and someone's eating a chicken sandwich. And the person in the chicken sa- sandwich will start saying something like, oh man, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry I'm eating this chicken sandwich. I know, I know it probably bothers you. And I, I, you know, this line someone gave me, I really like to use with students every so often because it gets them to think and it's funny too. And say, okay, it's not, not my funeral. <laughs> so, and they kind of chuckle, but then they go, hmm. <laughs> I said that once to a student and she she's like, I you know, I didn't think of it that way. I don't think I can eat this now. So I was like, sorry to have ruined your lunch. Not really. But, you know, it, uh, it, it's one of those things I think that gets students to think. But I, I think I think it is important to have these kinds of responses ready to, to kind of anticipate what a conversation would be like. We all get into them, whether mm-hmm. we want to or not. We're almost always all in situations where we're going to be the only vegan or we're going to be kind of targeted or picked on for the veganism. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to have some of these things in mind, you know, I also, but I also think that we can't just have these things in mind. I think they don't just come from nowhere. I think it's really important to be a widely read vegan, to know the reasons behind your veganism. And we all know them. Like some of us know them at a very intuitive level. We know them in our guts, Mm -hmm. but I think it's important to also know the logical reasons for your veganism and to be able to have an an argument that you can articulate about why you are vegan. That makes sense. That is logical. And I think to do that, you need to be wide. You need you need to have read a lot of things within within the movement itself. And I think you also need to not let yourself get flustered by it. Yeah, and know when to say when. You know, that's know, true too. Know when it's going to be useful, when it's not going to be useful. And sometimes, like like on the plane, you're kind of trapped. You don't have much yeah. choice. <laughs> that's true. So I mean, you do you you do the best with you know where you are, what, with what you have, and. With some people, like the guys in the subway. <laughs> yeah, but you just not, walk away. You just walk away. <laughs> that, that's not a place where you're going right. to, I don't think with the guy in the subway mm-hmm. in Pennsylvania, you're not going to have a lot of luck. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just don't think you are. Uh, yeah. Or sometimes with your friends, like a, a joke comment would be more appropriate than, than you know, not, but it, that might get them to think. It depends so, on the friend. I mean, yeah. I think a lot of, I think a lot of people take a lot of shit from their friends and I don't think they should. No. I think if your friends are giving you shit about being vegan, you need to have a discussion with them and tell them, look. This is serious. This means something to me. You need to fucking quit it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's it. And if that doesn't work, you need to find new friends. Yeah. No yeah. offense, but come on. Yeah. If, and something with family too. I mean, well, family's different. Yeah, but sometimes you can. Sometimes you just have to put your foot down. Like, look, <laughs> this is what I'm doing. It means a lot to me. Yeah. And uh, you know, please, you're offending me terribly by what you're doing. Some people don't even realize it. Like. Uh, Uncle Bill, <laughs> you know, he uh, eventually got to him that I was he uh, I was really upset that he didn't I thought he didn't like my cookies. You know, that one Christmas I made him a whole huge shitload of vegan cookies. Yes, and he apologized. He did. And, and for those of you who don't know my Uncle Bill, uh, who haven't read Vegan Freak, he is mentioned in mm-hmm. I think chapter doesn't matter. He's basically Archie Bunker mm-hmm. when it comes down to it. Um, I grew up with the guy, so I'm used to the dirty jokes. Uh, you know, they don't. I, I I'm used to it. Mm-hmm. You know, what else could I do? I know, and I know how he is. So it doesn't bother me much. He just picks on everybody all the time. That's the way he is. Doesn't everybody have an uncle like that? Yeah, probably. Everybody does have an uncle. <laughs> yep. like that. I want to be that uncle. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get your brother to have kids. Oh, uh, he probably will. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, no, I don't really want to be that uncle. Um. So he he kind of does that, but that one year, he, you know, Jenna made this beautiful vegan cookies, and he's like, oh, "Are these vegan?" And he started whining about mm-hmm. the most other stuff, and Jenna got really upset. So for good reason. Oh. I mean, someone fucking with your cookies—that's not cool. Know, but you got really upset, and uh, I understand that. But I think that gave him a little, a little. I don't know. I know. The, well, the point that we make in, in Vegan Freak also is that you really should not try to let yourself get upset. That's true. And it's hard sometimes. It is hard. <laughs> but like you said, be, people think that vegans are joyless and all that. And Carol Adams says, you know, in her writings that a lot of other people will try to bring that on. Of course. They'll try to make you se- seem joyless by making you angry. So don't let them. I agree. But anyway, uh, with Uncle Bill, I think the thing mm-hmm. that, that I learned with him was just to be like, yeah, okay, you kind of brush him Whatever. off. And then you don't feed him. So it mm-hmm. doesn't feed what he's doing. I mean, mm-hmm. like, it was like this time in class, in my animal rights class, we watched Earthlings, right? Three quarters of the class, the movie's over, they're in tears. This one guy stands up and says, wow, I'm going to go eat a hamburger. <laughs> and this one, this one girl in the class looked at him and said, you are sick. 
<laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> in my head. Like, I didn't do it. Right, of course. And she just looked at me. She, you are sick. She's tears in her eyes, mm-hmm. you know? And it, he was just meant, he was trying to make a joke. And everybody in the class had just watched this really graphic film about animal abuse. And he he was made to look like the asshole for trying to trying mm-hmm. to play it like that. And I, I appreciated that. Um, and sometimes you can turn situations like that. Are we giving you a lot of concrete advice? No, because we can't. It depends on the situation. Mm-hmm. It depends on the context. But I think it's important to really have a couple ideas in mind about how you would approach these things. Think about it. I mean, all of us have uh, spare cycles every so often. You mm-hmm. know, when we're doing nothing. You're, mm-hmm. on, uh, you're on the train. You're washing the dishes. You're on the shitter. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the shitter. I mean, hey, you're hey, vegan. Hey, there you go. You're vegan. You're going to be on the toilet a lot. Put reading material in the bathroom. There so every you go. time in the bathroom, you can learn something new. There you go. You're <laughs> you're on the shitter. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I do have some really good ideas in the bathroom generally. In the shower, I usually have pretty good ideas too. Hmm. <laughs> I saw this thing. I saw this thing on one of these like productivity websites where this mm-hmm. guy... Uh, uses those kids crayon you know like for the shower uh-huh. you can write on tile he uses those in the shower for when he has ideas and he writes them down in the shower <laughs> that's a so good idea <laughs> it is but i don't like that because that extends the cure the sphere of capitalist influence into the shower it becomes that's a site true. of productivity <laughs> rather than a site of just being fucking clean right um and you know a warm shower is always a nice thing uh but you, everybody has these spare these spare processor cycles sitting around um and you can use those to think about the kinds of things that people might say to you or use your past experience and imagine how you might you might respond to some of those issues. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, really vital to do. Either that or do what I did and teach a class of undergraduates about veganism and animal <laughs> rights. And you will get the whole range of responses within one or two weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I did. That was the first time I really had to deal with. So, uh, my fir- the t- first time I taught an animal rights class, I think everybody thought the class was about cuddly animals. Why they thought that, I don't know. The class was called Meat or Murder. <laughs> okay, it wasn't called come pet the cuddly animals. No, it was called meat or murder, right? Everybody came to the class. I think they were all like, you know, cuddly terrians who liked cute animals. But then I started laying the shit on the line. I started making these comparisons between their dogs and the animals that are in factory farms. And they started to get upset with me. And I started to hear all of the all of the critiques. Mm-hmm. And it was useful for me. Actually. It was frustrating. <laughs> sure. But I learned a lot by that. So mm-hmm. I think you'll have to go through a couple of these before you can learn the most effective strategies, but there are effective strategies and I think it's worth pursuing them. That's true. The more you do it, the more you'll be comfortable with doing it. So. Absolutely. So anyway, I don't want to belabor this point. So what do you think? Vegan verbal jujitsu. Vegan verbal jujitsu. So the whole point is just defense. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know a lot about jujitsu, but the idea <laughs> is really just to find a, a position of defense, a mm-hmm. position where you can be sturdy, where you can stand strong, mm-hmm. but not yeah. where you're going to destroy your enemy. Exactly. Where you can frame the debate in your own terms. That's right. But not completely annihilate. I think it's really important <laughs> to frame the debate very early on. Okay. So, and, uh, you know, if you need if you need ways of coming up with responses to the average questions and things like that, there are a lot of books out there worth reading. Mm-hmm. So, And this, these kind of threads come up on our forums a lot. They do and People are like, I've heard this argument today. I didn't know how to respond. How can Help me, help me. And yeah. a lot of people have other ideas. So. Help me, help me. <laughs> anyway, we're done with that. Okay. I don't want to. Oh, no. What did you, what? I didn't put the music in. <sighs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we have a song, actually. Yeah, uh, we haven't had a song in a while. We have not. And uh, it just have to find it. I'm sorry. We're. While I was filling the soundboard with new sounds, uh, Windows stuck its thumb in its ass and said, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and quit. <laughs> and uh, it just didn't It just didn't happen. Um, so how come your right-click thing does not work? This is I one probably thing, don't even have it turned on. This is one thing I really, really Use fucking hate about, about Macs. Control. Why, why, why is there not a right-click? Ugh! Fuck, it's trying to rename the Con- file. Control. I, oh, there it goes. <laughs> you're doing, you're hitting option. I, I, I fucking, <laughs> you know, can I just rant for a second? Okay. What, what is it with Max? They ship with a mouse that looks like a cough drop and has one button. You need two buttons on a mouse. Mm-hmm. How can you have a mouse with one button? I'm sorry, Randy. Randy works for Apple, one of our listeners. I think the single button mouse is the single most stupid thing Apple has ever done. Wait a minute. That's tough. 
Man, there's so many other stupid things. Uh, um, well, you know, I don't agree with you because I like my cough drop mouse. But, 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 but. Because I've been using it for so long, it seems natural to me, and I don't know what to do with my other fingers when I have too many buttons on my mice. Two buttons is too confusing <laughs> for you? Well, there's. But no, there's like there's often there's side buttons and there's top buttons and well, then you there's can a scroll wheel and but like, even what the uh, hell? I don't need all okay this. fine a scroll wheel you don't like a scroll wheel <laughs> oh I wheel? do like the scroll wheel but. come on <laughs> okay anyway enough ranting and raving this <laughs> is from Andy Angry Duck on the forums moderator extraordinaire uh, friend of the show for a very long time good guy in general just a stand up individual yes he is. He's, he's a compliment to veganism. Uh, he sent us this song called The Vegan Revolution Draft Dodger Anthem by Good Clean Fun. I really like this because it what it does is it pokes fun at people who are concerned about animal rights but won't do something like go vegan. Um, and I think I should probably read you some of the lyrics out of here because you may not understand them in the song. Uh, I think fur is a crime. I protest all the time. You should see all my bumper stickers. That Firestorm song sure gets me singing along. My righteousness never flickers. I think PETA is swell and vivisectionists go to hell. I fight. I live to fight the man. And if there is ever a cause with no dietary laws, I'll be the first to take a stand. <laughs> the animals, I see their pain with ease, but don't expect me to give up pizza with cheese. And he goes on and talks about all that. I know I could be the best vegan the world's seen. It's such a shame. My doctor says I can't because I need the protein. What's right or what's wrong is not a, is not a tough decision, but animal torture is a part of my new religion. Hey, you know what I'm down with? <laughs> what it's about that I happen to mention I need the strength to work out because I'm building up muscle I'm a growing boy such a cruel twist of fate I'm allergic to soy excuses excuses are not for me I've wised up but these leather shoes were free these shoes were free so this is to all of you out there well hopefully our listeners know better if you're not if you're not vegan yet you should be and if you're not vegan yet we want to know how we can make you vegan get in touch with us We'll get, we will get you vegan. <laughs> what can we do to get you into veganism today? Okay, here's a song. Gotta turn that down. <laughs> I think for is a crime. Punch all the time. You see all my bumper stickers. That fire from song can be singing along. Okay, that was Vegan Revolution Draft Dodger by Good Clean Fun. <sighs> aren't, aren't, didn't I hear that somebody in that band was a fun, like a vegan, uh, a vegan fundamentalist? <laughs> Wrong kind of fundamentalist, a Christian fundamentalist? I have no idea. I don't know anything about the band. I'm sure we'll hear. Uh, I think someone, uh oh, I hear dogs barking. <laughs> it's a running dog of socialism barking. Uh, anyway, you know, I'm hungry. It is dinner time. Yeah. I'm sure the dogs are hungry too. That's probably where they're antsy. No, they probably saw something. No, outside. our neighbor just came home. Oh, uh, that so. bothers them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tonight it's it's taco night. <laughs> it is. It is. Every every podcast every Wednesday we do the podcast or Thursday and then we do the show so late that there's nothing else to make so we end up making really quick bean tacos. They're good though. They are good. Anyway, I, I'm Mexican. That's all I eat. By <laughs> right. the way, you know when I was a kid, I just thought I'll I'll share the story since it's. Story time with Bob and Jenna. I'll share this quick story with you. When I was a kid and I would go over to people's houses for dinner, they would, (laughs) 
they'd be like, we made tacos tonight. We thought you would like to come over. And I was like, well, why? And they're like, because don't you eat tacos a lot? Uh, and the tacos I would eat as a kid were really different than the tacos that, that, that white people ate. Like my family's, you know, they look white, but the tacos were different than the average, you know, white bread person would eat. Mm-hmm you white bread people eat these big crunchy ass like giant tortilla chip tacos we would eat these like little small soft lovely fried tacos they're very good bad for you but good um anyway and my my mom makes some very nice vegan versions of those she does as do we Mm -hmm. okay moving on uh we have another another voicemail here it's uh, quick uh, what now what now i'm waiting oh oh Oh, spinning beach ball yes (sighs) okay wait, 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 wait here it is Hey, I've just got to read this to you because it's too funny to just uh, forward it to you. This is from AmericanCatholic.org, their FAQ section. Question, are chicken and fish considered meat? Answer, chicken, yes, fish, no. (laughs) The Catholic Church's abstinence laws consider that meat comes only from animals such as chickens, cattle, or pigs, all of which live on land. Birds are also considered meat. Fish are a different category of animal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, just because the fish swim, that means they're not meat? Is that why? Is that what causes all this confusion? Oh, you're a vegetarian, so you eat fish? Is the story, is the story <laughs> apocryphal that, in fact, the, the church had fishing interests way back in the day and needed to promote those interests and therefore uh, entirely possible. had banned uh, or had promoted the consumption of fish in order to increase their own interests? Wouldn't surprise me in the least. Think of that. A church... Doing something to increase its own interests? The Catholic Church especially? <laughs> really? Oh my God. You mean the people that rape Latin America? Yeah. And told people to speak Christian? Mm-hmm. They would never do that. No. Right. Moving on. <laughs> okay. Um, now we're going to talk about an article that was sent to us by Mango. The Mango. <laughs> um, and it's an op-ed piece from the New York Times, and it's called Pig Out by Nicolette Han Niemann. Niemann? Niemann. <laughs> Nyman? Human. <laughs> Human, Nyman. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm going to end up reading most of it because it's not all that long. It's short, and it's um, all fairly. Per- and you read pertinent. well, unlike me. Not always. Sometimes I trip over my words or I say things funny. I read like a you know like a third grader or something. No, you don't. My name is Bob. <laughs> I read real good. <laughs> Anyway, with some fanfare, the world's largest pork producer, Smithfield Foods, recently announced that it intended to phase out certain cages for its breeding females. Called gestation crates, the cages virtually immobilize pigs during their pregnancies in metal stalls so narrow they are unable to turn around. Did you just turn down my headphones? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Am I not speaking loudly enough? You spoke a lot louder the moment I turned them down. (laughs) Anyway. Numerous studies have documented crated sows exhibiting behavior characteristic of humans with severe depression and mental illnesses. Well, no shit. Getting rid of gestation crates. I can't see. I can't say gestate. Ge- Do you want me to read it? No. Oh. Gestation. Okay. Gestation, gestation crates. Already on their way out in the European Crustacean Union. Gestation crates? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> You're not helping. <laughs> Getting rid of gestation crates already on their way out in the European Union is welcome and long overdue, but more action is needed to end the inhumane conditions at America's hog farms. Of the 60 million pigs in the United States, over 95% are continuously confined in metal buildings, including the almost 5 million sows in crates. In such setups, feed is automatically delivered to animals who are forced to urinate and defecate where they eat and sleep. Their waste festers in large pits a few feet below their hooves. Intense ammonia and hydrogen sulfide fumes from these pits fill pigs' lungs and sensitive nostrils. No straw is provided to the animals because that would gum up the works, as it would if you tossed straw into your toilet. In my work as an environmental lawyer, I've toured a dozen hog confinement operations and seen hundreds from the outside. My task was to evaluate their polluting potential, which was considerable. But what haunted me was the miserable creatures inside. They were in crowded... They were crowded into pens and cages, never allowed outdoors, and never even provided a soft place to lie down. Their tails had been cut off without anesthetic. Regardless of how well the operations are managed, the pigs subsist in inherently hostile settings. Disclosure, my husband founded a network of farms that raise pigs using traditional non-confinement methods. The stress, crowding, and contamination inside confinement buildings foster disease, especially respiratory illnesses. In addition to toxic fumes, bacteria, yeast, and molds have been recorded in swine buildings at a level more than 1,000 times higher than in normal air. 
To prevent disease outbreaks and to stimulate faster growth, the hog industry adds more than 10 million pounds of antibiotics to its feed. The Union of Concerned Scientists estimate. I'm always doing the podcast. Dogs here. <laughs> I'm all. Hi. Yes. This mountain of drugs, a staggering three times more than all antibiotics used to treat human illnesses, is a grim yardstick of the wretchedness of these facilities. There are other reasons that merely... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> he keeps pushing his head into my arm. There are no- <laughs> Hi, Molo. Stop spoiling him. <laughs> Sorry. You spoil the dogs. He's too cute. <laughs> they are good all day until you come home. I know. <laughs> uh, then you come home and they're like, ooh, mom's here. <laughs> She pays attention to us whenever we want. She gives us treats for no reason. She spoils us. <laughs> go ahead. All right. There are other reasons that merely phasing out gestation crates does not nearly go does not go nearly far enough. I, yeah, of course. Okay. Keeping animals in such barren environments is serious is a serious deprivation. Pigs in nature are active, curious creatures that typically spend ten hours a day foraging, rooting, and roaming. Sounds like the dogs. Yeah. Hey, Molly, no! Hey, don't eat the mixer! He started to chew on the mixer. Vegetarian vet, Veterinarians consider pigs as smart as dogs. Oh, stop. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, so sure about your intelligence level right now, Molly. Come on, we just need to get this I done. Know, I know, I know. Imagine keeping a dog in a tight cage or crowded pen day after day with absolutely nothing to chew on, play, or with otherwise occupy its mind. Americans would universally denounce that as inhumane. That's right. Extreme boredom is considered the main reason pigs in confinement are prone to biting one another's tails and engaging in the other in other aggressive behavior. So what do they do? They, of course, cut off their tails rather right. than actual, you know, taking care of the problem. Finally, even if the gestation crate is abandoned, pork producers will still keep a sow in a narrow metal cage once she gives birth to her piglets. This slightly larger cage, called a farrowing crate, severely restricts a sow's movement and makes normal interactions between mother and piglets impossible. Because confinement buildings are far from cities and lack windows, all of this is shielded from public view. But such treatment of pigs contrasts sharply with what people say they want for farm animals. Surveys consistently find that Americans believe all animals, including those raised for food, deserve humane treatment. A 2004 survey by Ohio State University found that 81% of respondents felt that the well-being of livestock is that important as that of pets. Such sentiment was behind the widely supported Humane Slaughter Act of 1958, which sought to improve treatment of cattle and hogs at slaughterhouses. But it's clear that Americans expect more. They want animals to be humanely treated throughout their lives, not just at slaughter. To ensure this, Congress should ban gestation crates altogether and mandate that animal anti-cruelty law be applied to farm animals. As a cattle rancher, I am comfortable raising animals for human consumption, but they should not be made to suffer. Because we ask the ultimate sacrifice of these creatures, it is incumbent on us to ensure that they have decent lives. Let us view the elimination of gestation crates just as a small first step in the right direction. The ultimate sacrifice? They don't need to do it. There, no one needs that sacrifice from animals. You can no, live it, just fine without it. Mm-hmm. It makes them sound like they're a war hero. That I they know. willingly, yes, we will sacrifice ourselves for you humans so you can eat. What animal would choose that? None. That, that's fucking bullshit. Isn't it? And this is why welfareism is so dangerous. You couldn't expect a podcast without us picking on welfareism at least <laughs> once. Because people still see them as things that are part of the food chain, not as beings. Even if they see the suffering, even if this right. woman who sees the suffering says, okay, well, we can just make them suffer less, but then still eat them at the end. Yeah, it's the ultimate sacrifice, it's the ultimate and it's sacrifice. for us. Exactly. Because that mindset is still there. Mm-hmm. We still have these problems. It's like the white man's burden, Mm -hmm. you know, from colonialism. It's like, well, we need to go educate those stupid backwards natives. And it's like the animals want to give their lives for us. Of course Mm -hmm. they do. You know, don't you see them running towards us, slitting their necks open? (laughs) It's like, no. You know, the whole thing is about animals resisting. That's what Temple Grandin is all about. Smoothing the passage of those animals into the slaughterhouse to prevent that resistance. Mm Mm-hmm. That article is enraging. It is. And she spends the whole entire article talking about why it is we treat, you know, how we treat these animals so horrendously and why they deserve better. And yet mm-hmm. the conclusion she comes to is no more gestation crates. Right. Why not just stop eating Don't the animals? eat them. If you feel, <laughs> no, there's no compelling reason to consume animals Mm-mm. today. None. Or really ever. But there's no compelling reason. Mm-mm. None. None. They taste good is not a compelling reason. It's not. Because we've been doing it for centuries is not a compelling reason. Not at all. It's convenient is not a compelling reason. Mm-mm. You know, that's Peter Singer's compel- compelling reason, but it's not mine. Mm-mm. There are times 
look, there are times when I'm traveling and there's nothing vegan to eat, but that means that I eat something else. I mean, I, I find something small to eat rather than eating a whole meal. That's mm-hmm. the way life is. Yep. If it means eating a bag of potato chips, that's what we eat, unfortunately. Well, you know, I'd probably rather eat nothing than eat a bag of chips. True. But, but anyway, that's that. Uh, also, some breaking news that I received this week from our forums. <laughs> From the Diminutive Male Genitalia Disorder Center Research Organization, new research finds a long-suspected link between hunting and small penis size. Diminutive Male Genitalia Disorder has, until this month, been considered a theory in the scientific world, but now the long-suspected link between unusually unusually small penis size has been established as a scientific fact by the Diminutive Male Genitalia Disorder Research Organization. They apparently conducted a two-year study on men with Diminutive Male Genitalia Disorder. I would read you the whole thing, but somehow I printed it and the whole right-hand side of the page got cut off. <laughs> I so missed that. I didn't see that either. Yeah. I, I looked it on the screen and then I was like, oh, I'm going to read this. And then I printed it and didn't look at it until I sat down. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, what happens is, is there was a study, the supposedly a study done to investigate the relationship between having a small member and going hunting. And it says, it's really quite interesting, Dr. Steam says. Stearns, Steams, whatever. Like much folklore, it appears... Certainly, in this case, there is a foundation in fact. This is the first time that this has been conducted on men who hunt, and it shows quite definitively uh, the link between what we are calling the thrill of the kill and a smaller than average, something statistically significant cutoff. (laughs) Damn. I have diminutive printer size issues here. (laughs) Anyway, uh, the whole point is is that if you hunt, you've got a small dick. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. That's pretty funny. Yep. I'm wondering if it's also tied to having a big truck, too. Probably. I always, I always think that, you know, the vehicle is an extension of the... Mm-hmm. I, I say it's because I've always driven small cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you drive an excursion or a V8 truck, I don't know. <laughs> You've got some issues? <laughs> Are you trying to... I mean, is, is that really your phallus writ large across the road? Is that what that is? Is that you're trying to extend your, could, your masculinity? Could be, could be. Yes. You know, the other day I was at the co-op. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> and I pull into, you know, the co-op, and we always make fun of co-ops. Even though I love, I absolutely love the co-op. I couldn't I live without it. I couldn't live without it. I love it. our co-op. But we love to make fun of it anyway. There's this woman who parked outside with an excursion at the co-op, probably yes. going inside to buy her free-range buffalo meat. Do and They sell free-range? Yeah, they yes, do. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, and while she was inside, she left it running. Because well, apparently she wasn't using enough gas while <laughs> just she driving, was driving it around. She had to leave running while she ran into the store. Have you ever seen a yellow excursion? <laughs> school buses. Yeah, there Actually, you go. I, they do use them for school buses around here. Yeah, they do. So, yeah. It's ridiculous. Anyway. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, like President, uh, I, I said President, I was almost going to say President Cheney. But like uh, <laughs> Vice President Cheney says, conservation is a fine personal value. Oh, yes. But not really appropriate for national policy. No, apparently. He's actually said that in mm-hmm. the past. So, uh, you know, I, well, let's put some bush in the show. It's been a while. Uh, I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets. There you go. <laughs> rumors on the internets. <laughs> ah, are we done? We are done. My God. I felt, I felt like we were a little discombobulated this show. We were a little scattered, but Why? I think we got the point across. I think because, well, because the dogs just bust in the room and... True. When I was trying to read a serious story. and Okay, well, anyway, um, I want to mention one thing before we do go. We've got a new commenting system over at veganfreakradio.com. You can come to our site. If you have a microphone on your computer, you can leave us a comment right on the page. It will be mailed to us, and we can play it on the show. So you don't need to bother with the long-distance system anymore if you don't want to. Or you can call us at 267-295-1944. We'd love to hear from you. But if you don't want to spend the money... If you're a teenager who doesn't want that number showing up on your cell phone bill, (laughs) your mom and dad wondering who the hell you're calling in area code 267, which I think is in Philadelphia, who you're calling in area code 267, get on, get your microphone and leave us a fucking voicemail, man. Yeah, or if you're overseas. If you're overseas, all of it, as long as you have a microphone, it works. So that's it, veganfreakradio.com on the right hand side of the page. If I scroll down a little, it's there. I have a big monitor so I can see it, but... What are the dogs? Are they f- dogs fighting, fighting under, the under the table? All right, let's get this rolling. Here. All right, get, get this get this show on the road. So, Everybody's hungry. Me too, but I still have to put the show together. Wow, you gonna cook? We'll put together the taquitos. Do you gonna cook while I? Sure. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, be in touch with us. Yeah, but <laughs> the division of labor—it's a different thing. Uh, show at veganfreakradio.com. 
Uh, I don't even know the new things anymore, so go ahead. Show it. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to our website and see the show notes at veganfreakradio.com. Holy shit. Table just moved like five inches. Um, you can stop them from fighting under the table. All right. I'm going to yell. I'm not yelling. I'm just like, I'm just saying. All right. This is crazy. Bye. Bye. I'm a vegan freak. I'm a vegan freak.